We're delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Anthony Lewis, who is the curator of Scottish history for Glasgow Life Museums. His talk, Opening Doors to Edinburgh's New Towns Past, its plannings as reactions to plague, poverty, and property ownership, focuses on some of the possible motivations for enlarging and improving Edinburgh in the first half of the 1700s. It will refer to HM General Register House itself as a key building in this process and emphasise the importance of using the archives held here in the National Records of Scotland and elsewhere to appreciate their contributions to understanding Edinburgh's people and the city's institutions at a time of crisis. Over to you, Dr. Lewis, thank you. Thank you very much, Tessa. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Can I have the second slide? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to the National Records of Scotland, to General Register House, to all archivists and librarians and curators at the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh City Archives, and who've helped me prepare for this talk, and also the research that's gone into my thinking, because what I'm going to talk to you about is very much research in, in the making. I'm going to share with you some ideas. Um, the re data retrieval I've managed to have um, isn't ideal. I haven't got total recall on the events that I'm going to talk to you about, but I'm always of the opinion that there's another archive to be discovered somewhere. So. Um, if the doors are open to archives in Edinburgh or Glasgow or anywhere where you live, please go through them. Uh, use your archive service, use your libraries, and please use your museum services. So the gist of this paper is to assess responses to a crisis in 1720, and the crisis was the threat of bubonic plague coming to uh, Great Britain and Scotland from Europe. There are three areas I'm particularly concerned with, which are medical, architectural, and political. In terms of a literary review, there's not a lot written about the public health of Scotland and Scottish cities in the 1720s, but there is uh, Professor Richard Roger and Paul Laxton's study of Henry Littlejohn's work on the 19th century Edinburgh, and that sets uh, some framework uh, to understand what happened in the 1700s to what occurred in the particular period of the 1800s that they look at. Um, the timeline of, of 1720 can account for plans for new streets and the removal of nuisances and wastes in, in Edinburgh. Uh, and it, I argue that the new town planning begins in this year uh, on and continues uh, from then on. There are, are also uh, urban histories written in the 18th century, such as Alexander Kincaid's uh, history of Edinburgh. Um, but they do not mention um, the archives that I mentioned that I source in Edinburgh City Archives or the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. But that's not to say that I'm breaking completely new ground because uh, in the Book of Old Edinburgh Club in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, papers by Cowan and then Mearns and Russell noted that in January 1720, Edinburgh Town Council looked to develop its recently purchased Loch Bag estate on the fields immediately to the north of the old Edinburgh with houses, drains and bridging North Lock. And then much later on in 2005, Connie Byram uh, then added that uh, the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh supported the draining of the North Lock. And what I'm doing is bringing these two, um, bringing these two uh, together um, to argue that, that firstly, the motives for the council and college's proposals was the threat of plague, uh, remedied by cures recommended uh, more common for more common urban diseases, uh, such as good air. Secondly, that the architect for the plans for these remedies was Alexander McGill, who had just been appointed Edinburgh Town Council's salaried architect. And three, the scale of the plans can be understood as emotional responses to the threat, uh, the influences of diseases, uh, the motivations for urban change and the importance of McGill as an architect at this time have genuinely been overlooked. Uh, other more common cited motivations for change and creation of a new town could be politics, such as the, the loss of rich noblemen to London, the threats of losing Jacobite wars or regime change, and finances, uh, in this particular case, 
the need to improve finances after the South Sea bubble had burst. Remedies beyond planning uh, offer a contrast between religious faith and salvation and improvement and scientific knowledge in medicine to ensure uh, that it is perceptible and also quantifiable. The onus on making improvements to the houses was on property owners and not just the town council and Lord Provis. There were genuinely poor housing and poor living conditions, but salvation to those who were suffering ill health through them was offered through ministers rather than physicians. Many people could not afford a doctor uh, or they were offered apothecaries. Many could not afford to buy the medicines or drugs. There are a plethora of self-help medical books that are linked contagious diseases to poverty and the crisis of 1720 added to the threat uh, proposed or proposed remedies to these diseases for focus on living in a cleaner and more learned city. Within this, there is the importance of keeping housing records and planning for a new city. The importance of faith and given the political impasse to change urban architecture was a rhetoric of responsibility which shifted the onus from the town council or political groups onto the individual. The onus was to keep yourself, your home and your street clean. For most, uh, the doctor that they knew was a Presbyterian minister. The Presbyterian church records did not record health beyond keeping burial records and even these are fairly inconsistent. They do not indicate an interest in finding cures for plague or more common diseases. Beyond promoting self-help books, uh, Edinburgh Press's coverage of the fear of death gave little space for medical research. Commentaries relied on living a frugal and religious life. And I quote, you are paid for the excess and riot of your youth, your gouts, your palsies, which take you from limb after limb and all the senses one after the other except only for the sense of pain, yeah, which is reassuring. Uh, the search for redemption from, was from a mind distracted with anxieties and a body languishing with disease, unquote. But what did the town councils do to plan and build a healthier city? As I assess this, you should take the word system as in public health system with a pinch of salt. There is no system. As such, what we see is a piecemeal reaction, a knee-jerk reaction to a crisis. Uh, there is no sewage system or water system as such, um, as we might understand it today. However, both Glasgow and uh, Edinburgh Museum collections include examples of a system being put in place or being developed, such as the wooden water pipe you see, which is made from elm wood. And there is, genuinely a need for increased research uh, into this kind of material culture, including archeological surveys and recordings and mapping of where these pipes were laid and where they led to, of water springs, wells, drains and sewers from the 17th and 18th century cities. The politically triumphal political narratives lauding improvement should also be taken with caution. For example, Kincaid's uh, parenthesis of a dirty old town as opposed to a clean new town just doesn't stack up with the facts. Um, they both had their problems and they both had their virtues. Also, the court cases, accounts and reports indicating problems persisting. Uh, and with these, the assumptions of negative emotions associated with disappointment and perpetual grief exist. So next slide, please, Jonathan. So the plague, uh, the threat of the plague for 1720 is said to have uh, originated from Marseille, and this is an image of the port of Marseille. Uh, the, the French then pointed at Syria as being the origin of the plague, and the plague spread very quickly. By September 1720, the so-called Marseille distemper reportedly had killed 30,000 people, despite physicians declaring that it was not indeed a plague. Death was expected within 24 hours of diagnosis. By, Dun by October 1720, Dunkirk was refusing all ships for Marseille port entry. There was a form of lockdown and institutional fear and a discernible emotion of fear uh, was striking into decision making. The fate of sailors was not reported, but later reports of distemper included 215 dead in Avignon, 301 sick with all physicians and the infirmary manage managers dead. 
The contradictory reports suggest that plague had arrived at the Isle of Man. Some reported it, others denied it. And in London, there was a proclamation issued from St. James's to prohibit ships from all of France landing goods or people in Britain. Quarantine had to be performed. So what we see is a form of lockdown. Physicians recommended that people performed fasts to protect themselves against possible infection. Fear was an emotive response to disease leading to hunger and insularity. The prospect of plague arriving in Britain alarmed the media and general public reading stories about its death tolls in France. Press reported suggested remedies that individuals could take to protect themselves, such as smoking tobacco to intercept contagions from entering the brain, lungs and stomach. This preventative was aided by breathing air through the nostrils and mouth, which also gave antidotes. Who would have thought it? In London, physicians planned a response to the threat by proposing a barracks or hospital to be built on Blackheath, where infected people would be treated by apothecaries and surges instead of women. So what of Scotland? What we're gonna see is that Edinburgh responds to what London uh, proposed and did. The threat uh, also alarmed politicians following the government's proclamation prohibiting French uh, shipping. Uh, letters from London arrived warning Scottish law promise to block French shipping uh, from all ports. A Scottish lockdown and lazaretto scheme was expected to follow. Edinburgh Town Council and the Convention of Royal Boroughs warned the magistrates of Inverkeithing to take measures to stop plague infections arriving from shipping from the Bay of Biscay, for example. The Lord Provost of Perth warned Dundee, Aberdeen and Montrose councils to do the same thing for shipping from the Isle of Man. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, the Lord Chief Justice Clerk, Archibald Cockburn, wrote to the Lord Provost of Glasgow to demand that these measures be taken for shipping entering the Clyde. Edinburgh followed London's example in consulting with physicians and looking to new architecture to remedy the threats of infection. The proposals are implied new urban architecture could combat bubonic plague patients. But in reality, the crisis and reactions to it was also to promote new building schemes to imagine common urban contagious diseases, markets and movement of waste in Edinburgh in terms of cleansing teams known as scavengers, planning and laying down sewers and drains, also known as cybers, shores, shores, sinks and culverts, supplying fresh water for them and even planning new streets and districts. There are no plans showing where the, the, the differences between these types of sewers and drains and what they were for. There are no plans of the pavement architecture and there's no plans of causewaying uh, and the laying of pipes. These were all to be discovered and to be researched further. Can I have the next slide, please? Living conditions. Uh, Defoe was uh, very polite about Glasgow causing it a clean city. He was less polite about Edinburgh, calling it notorious. Uh, he, he also points uh, prophetically to the north uh, as a place to still to build a new city uh, when he was writing in the early 1700s, but publishing in the 1720s. The common killing diseases in cities were consumptive tuberculosis, chin cough, which is whooping cough, fevers, fluxes, which are dysenteries, uh, smallpox, uh, were constantly in the death registers. The lack of fully accounted death records for the period would not have helped politicians, doctors, or architects plan the remedies. And yet the issues of overcrowded housing and physical congestion due uh, to cause diseases have been obvious. Closest and wines off the high streets offer congested spaces which were difficult to clean and provide clean air or fresh air, which were recommended by the physicians. In both Edinburgh uh, and Glasgow, there were no public health positions and political committees to counter disease. However, Royal College of Physicians, surgeons, apothecaries and barbers who performed surgeries were under town council authority uh, for the, and they were available for those who could afford them. So what do poorer people do to stay from, uh, from diseases? Well, this, the self-help books, Dr. Benjamin Martin, Dr. Buchan's family physician, Dr. Taylor's book following the work of Tissot, which linked poverty and diseases caused by putrid air from dung hills, bad sewers and stagnant water, common to insanitary living conditions, bad diet and alcoholism due amongst the urban poor, were all noted. For most, going to the toilet meant using a bucket or chamber pot in a closet or room. These were neither emptied into communal dung hills or main streets to be collected by scavengers or into guttering and drains in the hope that rainwater would flush it away into another common collection point. 
Captain Topham's letters about Edinburgh in the 1770s describes the process uh, quite neatly. But we still have the tight packed uh, horse closes and wines that you see in the Rothermay map of old Edinburgh. Uh, there was a habit of putting waste out by the sides and narrow spaces between properties. And these would fetter over time, causing damp and decay and probably a god awful smell. This human waste was mixed with that caused by animals and urban industries made in markets using carcasses and skins or fish and the compost of vegetable markets. Added to this cocktail of bad airs were industrial waste and smokes arising from home industries, factories, mills, warehouses, refineries, distilleries and breweries. So we've got a, a heady mix of things that can make you feel rather unwell here. In terms of providing water, the aim was to get water was, was clear, as was the aim to get clean air. Reservoir too. We can assume drinking water was also the water to clean out uh, the chamber pots, sewers, gutters and drains from the, the wells and pumps. Combined public fountains, uh, private wells and rainwater buckets, roof guttering and house drains are uh, added examples. Waste was also sold uh, as a fertilizer from uh, auctions known as roots and whoever uh, owned the root had a vested interest in keeping things as they were because that was a steady supply of money. Uh, so th this is uh, uh, one of the uh, ingredients to why property ownership didn't necessarily move with the idea of investing in a, a new city in ex where the existing streets were. There was just too much of a vested interest. Who was gonna give up their home uh, to make way for, for a cleaner city? That uh, was a, an important question. Can I have the next slide, please? So in the uh, city's histories, um, which don't mention the events of 1720, we can nevertheless from media and from town council minutes and the Royal College of Physicians minutes, see the importance of uh, reacting to the threats of the plague. Uh, Edinburgh Town Council for minutes of the 11th of January, 1720 instructed Lord Provost John Campbell then in London to seek an act of parliament to bridge the North Lock and develop the Lock End Estate, which purpose to the North. Campbell himself as president of the Royal Boroughs was in London to petition for an act of parliament to protect Scottish burgle uh, industries. The instruction was not accompanied uh, by related town council minutes pursuing this suggestion. The city's business carried uh, on as usual, but demand to Campbell suggests opportunism and urgency, a response to the reports of plague being circulated by the press. By November 1720, both Edinburgh Town Council and the Convention of Royal Boroughs knew the plague warnings and instructions to take precautions. Warnings were proclaimed from church pulpits not to buy French or Spanish goods and not to contact any Frenchmen or Spanish people. Edinburgh Town Council set up a committee to make an action plan and consult with experts. It decided to ask the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh for its advice. In response, the Royal College set up its own committee, which submitted a 10 point plan back to the Town Council within a week, again, indicating urgency. Initially, the Town Council's committee thought that a, a, a proper response would be to offer good perfumes to alleviate what they called infectious airs within properties uh, and enough medicines to combat the plague to be made ready. It requested that the, uh, the physicians, surgeons and apothecaries and church ministers of Edinburgh did not leave the city at this point of crisis as they would be needed. The Town Council and the college developed a 10 point plan, which I will go through. One, to drain the North Lock of what they called its noxious streams arising from its stagnant and corrupt water, uh, i.e. Uh, where sewage was being uh, emptied into the lock and prevent diseases caused by bad air. Two, the lock had to be replaced by a canal fed by constant running water from the public fountains currently feeding into the lock to produce uh, fresh water and prevent stagnation. Three, all slaughterhouses and markets selling entrails from the city uh, from animal slaughtering had to be removed. Um, four, carcasses uh, from those markets had to be buried and not le left exposed to the open air. Five, animal dunghills had to be removed to a greater distance away from the city center. 
six, the green market had to be better managed with all composts removed from outside the city. Seven, street cleaning. All streets, closes and lanes were to be cleaned frequently and exactly with water so that they were free from all nastiness uh, by which was meant animal and human excrement and waste. This street water was to flow freely and not stagnate. Eight, new public to toilets or houses of office as they called them were to be built at convenient distances from one another to the north and south of the city. Nine, there are also to be regular and reliable collections of waste from houses uh, with the practice of throwing waste and nuisances out of windows or the guardy loo as we call them uh, onto streets um, banned. 10, all vagrants, idle people and beggars should be removed and all the city's prisons were to be kept neat and clean. In other words, uh, they, they might end up in the prisons. And lastly, both the town council and the Royal College of Physicians committees sought divine protection from plague if God in his infinite mercy avert. This plan of action can also be contrasted with what happened in London at this time where streets, meat markets and slaughterhouses and prisons were inspected and better cleansed and for markets to be paved and preserved against infections. Illegal and anonymous markets and illicit alcohol shops were shut and the proposed Blackheath uh, Infirmary uh, was built to house up to 20,000 people. Begging was policed and the overcrowded housing addressed through ban lord, bad landlords being registered by the justices of the peace. London's politicians and physicians believe that overcrowded properties spread contagious diseases faster. In Edinburgh, the proposed changes were anticipated by landowners and politicians. For example, the proposed canal uh, was considered by politician Sir Alexander Brand of Bransfield. He mentioned it to the petition um, uh, to the King for December 1720 that the canal uh, of water to Edinburgh would also benefit the Duke of Roxburgh's Park at Jock's Lodge. And at the time, the Duke was the Secretary of State of Scotland. Uh, the Duchess of Argyle was also aware of the prospect of canal linking Leith to Edinburgh, and both examples imply how thoughts of a canal system was one to improve uh, water flow, but also connectivity between estates with the estate owners uh, receiving the benefit or, uh, from the, uh, the commerce to come. The architect Oh, the architecture section of the talk, uh, it concerns Alexander McGill for in November 1720, uh, Edinburgh Town Council and presumably McGill set out ideas to dam the North Lock and open communication with the north of the city. This included planning new housing for, inverted commas, a number of persons of note and character, closing commas. On the face of it, this appears to be a signifier of a new town. Uh, the order of all necessary professionals remained in Edinburgh to help tend to the sick and surely intended the city's architect was needed to plan a healthier city based on the reports supplied by the town council and the Royal College of Physicians. McGill fitted the profile of the people the town council consulted as uh, gentlemen of ingenuity uh, for their opinions and reports. He had the skill set and experience, sought to design and manage civil engineering projects such as bridges, water supplies, drainage and sewers. He was a surveyor, he made map estates and he knew how to demolish buildings and plan new ones, uh, plan new streets and squares. He was well known to Scottish magistrates and nobles alike. He was well known to the London Scots based architects such as James Gibbs. And uh, as Edinburgh City Council's architect, he was paid 50 pounds a year. That's equivalent to 10,000 uh, pounds in 2020 or thereabouts. And he was in post for five years. In 1720, it can also be assumed he was very much needed, and that's why he the post and he was employed. Um, on his death in 1734, McGill was famed for his eminence. There's no surviving archives and plans of McGill's work uh, in Edinburgh for the town council, but Palladio's architectural treatise gives some insights to the reference books he would have known and the knowledge of those he worked with, including Sir William Bruce, James Smith, Alexander Edwards, or Gibbs himself. So uh, the 1720 plans for Edinburgh Town Council, including planning new houses, new markets, public toilets, water supplies, streets and canals. And uh, we see in Palladio's treatise, there's the second book's chapter, um, 
recommends that architects find healthy places for new villas and new houses with good air, fertile land and good water. The third book expects cities to be equally healthy uh, with good, better roads, bridges, paving and trees and look to urban piazzas to have squares and sculptures in them. The fourth book uh, considers uh, temples to venerate health um, with statues of the gods of medicine and arts in them. In some way, we can see McGill would have had the knowledge to address what was expected of him for a new city. Then in terms of politics, there's a response of Edinburgh Town Council uh, to fund it in terms of ale tax. The programmatic responses included the Edinburgh Ale Tax Act of 1722-23. It followed up a request made to Lord Provost Campbell with Lord uh, Provost George Drummond's leadership to extend Edinburgh. Uh, this was to become Drummond's main cause in his political career. He would have known the reports and he would have known McGill's plans. So the ale tax would have paid for the following, the cleansing of North Lock and converting it into a canal. The act also recorded the council's uh, intended improvements um, to install better water supplies, new natural springs, new water pipes, and rebuild the high street's public fountains. There was to be a new poorhouse to manage vacancy. Leith Harbour was to be rebuilt and a new road connecting the port to the city begun. And there was a recommendation for building a uh, register house for the country's legal archives, making register house uh, and the national records of Scotland uh, one of the salient services and buildings are for the creation of a new city. In this context, Earl Mars uh, much applauded uh, legacies to Scotland seemed to be a summation of what uh, Campbell and McGill were thinking uh, of and in wanting to include. Um, later on, 1728, uh, the Duke of Hamilton um, looked uh, to a petition to also uh, develop the ideas from the Ale Tax Act, uh, which would include um, answering uh, the unwillingness to change or the lack of activity to develop property. And the Duke of Hamilton considered uh, the development of Leith Pier, the bridge over the North Lock and Canal, and once again, uh, Register House. So these are direct legacies of 1720, nearly 10 years later. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, so the first legacy is, is that of contemporary commentary. There's a Robert Mean, as somebody called himself, Edinburgh's laureate, is not commented upon or looked upon to represent himself as, uh, as a great poet, but he is a, a commentator for the people. He was a man of the high street, so to speak. He was postmaster and poet, a commentator, pamphlet reader, with a keen interest in cities, cleansing and sanitation, which uh, can be demonstrated from the 1730s to the 1760s. He commented on the bridge over the North Lock and the New Town and the old components of the 1720s program as I've described earlier. Next slide, please. Then there's the legacies of George Drummond's career from the 1720s to the 1760s. And he worked with Lord Provost Campbell and made improvements to the New Town's main aims to secure control of the city's affairs and manage its trades and economy. By the 1750s, he had secured the Broughton estate for himself and proposed an extension of the city in 1759, which potentially would develop land that he owned. Potential new town territory to the fields of the North where he could either sell or to Edinburgh Town Council for profit or control its development as the few superior himself. He promoted the 1720-21 reports as recommendations uh, in later years, and he would return to Register House as being the main building to justify having the new town. As another side to George Drummond, he also worked with Robert Craig, who was James Craig, the architect of Newtown Plan's grandfather. So I suspect the Craig family grew up in the knowledge that there was gonna be something big happening in the city. Can I have the next slide, please? The legacies also include James Craig's plan of uh, July 1767, and this features a canal and bridge. And these are, are legacies of the 1720 plans uh, by McGill. Uh, the Library of Treatises by Vitruvius, uh, Palladio and Alberti and Isaac Ware in Craig's uh, possession 
uh, were all touched upon town planning and health with wide open spaces, waters, drains, sewers, and the like all being discussed. Can I have the next slide, please? The fourth legacy is to look at the Royal College of Physicians um, Hall and Library from 1765, which was intended to be built where Register House now stands today. And we see that uh, that would be so appropriate as a legacy to the Royal College of Physicians input to the crisis of 1720. So James Clark of Pennycook uh, also touched upon the Newtown Bridge and the plan for this building, although it wasn't built. Uh, he's acting as a consultant and as an advisor. Can I have the next slide, please? Register House itself uh, has, can be traced to the uh, ale tax proposals of 1722, 23, and then later on in 1728. As I argue as a direct consequence to this idea of setting up a new city, which in itself was a reaction to the 1720 threat of plague. I show you a really marvelous um, plan in the role, in the NRS collection by Adam showing a section through the register house building and details of the rooms, tremendous. But also to the other side is a ground plan with an oval shelt uh, drain and sewer, which is really very important for what's gonna happen in the later new town. So on that, can I get the next slide please? And here we have examples of uh, John uh, plans uh, made in Edinburgh town council and to your right hand side, uh, an illustration of different plans of sewers in Isaac Ware's complete body of architecture and this particular set of plans are for the horse guards in London. The letter that you see in the middle with a sketch is written by John Adam, which comments upon David Hed Henderson's design uh, for the sewer in, to be built in the new town itself in 1768. And on the uh, far side is an example of how these so it's actually worked and functioned and connected to houses from Edinburgh City Council's Dean of Guild collection. There was still a lot of work to be done on how these were built and laid and where they actually still are within Edinburgh Newtown today. I suspect directly under the ground if we dug hard enough, but they haven't been recorded. Can I get the next slide, please? So on to James Craig Van, I touched upon his relationship with his grandfather, Robert Craig, um, and local knowledge and family knowledge being passed down. The new town that was built in the 1760s is the largest urban development in the country at the time and investments in sewers, drains, water pipes, paving, causey making and or street architecture and lay, road laying is intense. There's a lot of town council contracts. There's a lot of building materials like brick, stone, cement, elm wood, and cast iron pipes, carts, horses, laborers, tradesmen, and a plethora of architects and supervisors or overseers around at the same time. These are further legacies from 1720 in Craig's work, include work on public health. And these include plans for Lazaretto, the Leith Road, the Royal College of Physicians Hall and Library, which was in George Street, the Royal Infirmary Hospital, the Physic Garden and Leith, and a Bridewell plan as well. Can I have the next slide, please? And then there is the people who actually laid the sewers and drains, and this pie chart shows you uh, that the, the major contractor was a uh, mason and builder called William Jameson. And do you see uh, a cartoon of a magistrate's meeting with plans in hand with uh, Jameson's men behind him? These were highly lucrative um, uh, contracts to have and Jameson's own brick factory in Portobello would help uh, build said drains in the Nor Lock and Princess Street Gardens from the 1760s well into the 1790s and they linked the drains to the sewers in Princess Street, Queen Street and Charlotte Square. Can I have the next slide please? There are also legacies of workhouses and bridewells in the city. Um, the legacy of 1720 asks for uh, better care of poor and vagrancy. So new hospitals, works houses and bridewells and the addressing the question of how to care for the poorest and the sickest. And again, more research could be done on this to see how life was led by these people and what conditions of life were like in these buildings. 
And all these examples bar the print come from Edinburgh City Archives collections in the Deed of Guild collections. Uh, next slide, please. And then there's the market legacies of new markets, um, such as what was to be known as the Butcher's Bill in the 1780s, which uh, looked to rebuild the flesh market and slaughterhouses by the side of the North Lock, which was accomplished in the, in the 1790s. And the development of Bridge Street, moving the green market away from trade areas. So the issues of food preparation, rubbish disposal, and the health and, and environmental protection of customers and residents was addressed. And again, this is another legacy uh, from the 1720s that was enacted. And the plans that you see to your right is, the, is a plan of the flesh market from the um, Dean of Guild Collections and Edinburgh City Archives. And to the other side uh, is part of the uh, South Bridge scheme developed by um, James Craig uh, for his plan for improvement of the city of Edinburgh from 1785-86, where you see a covered market like a shopping mall being proposed um, just in front of the Tron Church. So in conclusion, and next slide, please. In conclusion, I'd like uh, to urge you to support the National Records of Scotland and General Register House and all the national services, be it the library or the museum and your local government services, archives, libraries and museums to find more information about what you're interested in. Uh, you've seen my peculiarity, uh, my, my ability to, to have an interest in um, sewers and public health. And it's not everybody I get a chance to talk to about this. So thank you very much for your time. You will also see that despite the lack or want of plans and documentation, I've examined the importance of the relationships between professional medical agencies, architects, politicians, and urban ways of life in the development of Edinburgh, with the main points being to link the 1720 plague as the motivation for change, for McGill to be seen as the first architect of Newtown plans. And these plans were not only about housing, but also bridging, canals, roads, markets, toilets, waters and sewers, for the motive to be a safer and healthier city to live in, and for the opportunity for national and local governments to work together. I would love to have a breakthrough moment in the archives, but I'd also love for physical evidence in the new town uh, to be uh, researched and for it to be um, recorded better for posterity. And also, um, I very much urge you to see Register House as the most important building in the new town and all its work as the legacy of what was intended in the 1720s as a reaction to disaster. Thank you very much for your time.